Hello, and welcome to Historical Happenings. Here, we'll take you on a journey through time and rediscover some historical tales that happened all over the world. Here, we'll tell you about significant news stories that happened that you might not have heard. Stay tuned, because at the end of the show, we'll tell you some ridiculous laws that either are or were on the books from some states. Check us out on Facebook and give us a follow on our socials for more historical happenings. The year was 1865. The date, April 14th. The 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated at Ford Theater during a show of Our American Cousin in Washington, D.C. by a man named John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth was an American actor, a member of the prominent 19th century Booth theatrical family from Maryland. Booth was also a known Confederate sympathizer who is known to have denounced President Lincoln and lamented the recent abolition of slavery in the United States. Booth's parents were famed British Shakespearean actor Junius Brutus Booth and his mistress, Mary Ann Holmes, both of whom moved to the United States from England in 1821. When they arrived in the United States, they bought a 150-acre farm near Bel Air, Maryland, where John Wilkes Booth was born. John was the ninth of ten children, John was named after the famed radical English politician John Wilkes, who was a distant relative. On the grounds of adultery, Junius's wife, Adelaide Delanois Booth, was granted a divorce in 1851. Later that year, Junius married his mistress, Mary Ann, on John Wilkes's 13th birthday. Junius built Tudor Hall on the Harford County property, which became the Booth family's summer home in 1851, while also holding a home and residence on Exeter Street in Baltimore, where they were listed as living in the 1850 census. Booth was very athletic and popular as a boy. He was skilled in horsemanship and fencing, and attended the Bel Air Academy, where the headmasters say of him, He is not deficient in intelligence, but disinclined to take advantage of the education opportunities offered him. Each day he rode back and forth from farm to school, taking more interest in what happened along the way than in reaching his classes on time. In 1850, Booth attended a school by the name of Milton Boarding School for Boys, which was a Quaker-run school in Sparks, Maryland. Later, he attended the St. Timothy's Hall, which was an Episcopal military academy in Catonsville, Maryland. At Milton's, students recited classical works by authors such as Cicero, Herodotus, and Tacitus. At the Military Academy of St. Timothy's, the students were required to wear military uniforms and had to do daily formations and strict drills. At the age of 14, Booth left school upon his father's death. Booth met a fortune teller of Romani descent while attending the Milton boarding school, where the fortune teller read his palm and told him of a haunted destiny. The fortune teller told him that he would have a grand but short life and was doomed to die young where he would meet a bad end. Booth's sister later recalled that he wrote down the Romani fortune teller's palm reading and would later show it to his family and other friends where he would often discuss its omens in what she called moments of melancholy. By the age of 16, Booth was interested in theater and politics and later became a delegate from Bel Air where he rallied the Know Nothing Party for Henry Winter Davis, who was the anti-immigrant party's candidate for Congress in the elections of 1854. In his acting career, Booth aspired to be like his father and brothers, Edwin and Junius Jr., and studied Shakespeare and practiced vocalizations around the woods at Tudor Hall. John Wilkes Booth made his acting debut as a supporting role of the Earl of Richmond in Richard III at the Charles Street Theater in Baltimore at the age of 17. The audience didn't receive him very well because he missed some of his lines and they mocked him for it. He also started acting at a theater owned by John T. Ford, where his family often performed. The theater was Baltimore's Holiday Street Theater. In 1857, in Philadelphia, Booth joined the Art Street Theater Stock Company. He played here for a full season. When he started his acting career, he requested to be called J.B. Wilkes, which was the pseudonym he used so he could avoid being compared to the other fam more famous acting members of his family. In 1955, American journalist and author of The Day Lincoln Was Shot, James A. Bishop, 
says that Booth developed into an outrageous scene stealer, but he played his part with such heightened enthusiasm that the audiences idolized him. On the opening night of Lucrezia Borgia at the Art Street Theater, he stumbled over his lines where instead of saying, Madam, I am Petruccio Pandolfo, he instead stumbled over his lines saying, Madam, I am Pandolfio Pet, Pandolfio Pet, Pantuccio Pet, damn it, who am I? which caused the audience to erupt with laughter. Booth starred as the Mohegan Indian chief Uncas in a play in Petersburg, Virginia later that year. The Mohegan Indians are a federally recognized tribe along the Thames River in Uncasville, Connecticut. When he was finished with the play, he later started working at the Richmond Theater in Virginia where he became very well known for his enthusiastic performances. In late 1858, he played as Horatio in Hamlet with his brother Edwin, who was the title role. After the play, Edwin brought John to the stage and said to the audience, I think he's done well, don't you? To which the audience responded with loud cheers and a yes chant. Booth performed in 83 plays in 1858, his favorite of which he said to have been the role of Brutus, who was the slayer of a tyrant. Booth stood five feet eight inches tall, had jet black hair, and was lean and athletic. Critics called him the handsomest man in America and a natural genius, and noted him to have an astonishing memory. Other critics had mixed reviews for Booth's performances. Though he was an acclaimed swordsman, a fellow actor once recalled that Booth would occasionally cut himself with his own sword. George Alfred Townsend, who was an American journalist, novelist, and worked as a war correspondent during the American Civil War, said that Booth was a muscular, perfect man with curling hair like a Corinthian capital. In Richmond, Virginia, in the 1859 to 1860 theatrical scene, Booth embarked on his first national tour as leading actor with Philadelphia attorney Matthew Canning serving as his agent, and by mid-1860 he was playing in cities like New York, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis, Columbus, Georgia, Montgomery, Alabama, and New Orleans. Speaking of Booth's acting, Walt Whitman is said to have stated he would have flashes, passages, I thought, of real genius. Drama critics of the Philadelphia Press said of him, Without having Edwin's culture and grace, Mr. Booth has far more action, more life, and we are inclined to think more natural genius. While in his hotel in Columbus, Georgia, Booth was accidentally shot in his hotel room in 1860, where many believed he would die from his injuries. In April of 1861, at Union-held Fort Sumter in South Carolina's Charleston Harbor, Confederate shore batteries under General P.G.T. Beauregard opened fire on the fort, solidifying the start of the American Civil War. Three days later, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteer soldiers to quell the Southern insurrection. At this time, Booth was starring in Albany, New York, and at the time was a very outspoken supporter of the South's secession, where he publicly called it heroic. With the support of the South, the public vehemently demanded that Booth be banned from the stage for making treasonable statements. But the critics in Albany were a little more kind to Booth, giving him rave reviews for his performances, where one even called him a genius and praising his acting for never failing to delight with his master masterly impressions. While the war raged across the states, Booth mostly appeared in Union and border states. In January of 1862, Booth played the lead role in Richard III in St. Louis and then made his Chicago debut. In March of that same year, he made his first acting appearance in New York City. In May of 1862, he played nightly at the Boston Museum in Richard III. On May 12th, 15th, and 23rd, Romeo and Juliet on May 13th, The Robbers on May 14th and 21st, Hamlet on May 16th, The Apostate on May 19th, The Stranger on May 20th, and The Lady of the Lions on May 22nd. After his performance of Richard III on May 12th, a review by the Boston Transcript hailed Booth as the most promising young actor on the American stage. In the role of Duke Piscara in The Apostate, Booth returned to the Boston Museum in January of 1863 that won him huge renown from critics and audiences alike. Booth played the title role in Hamlet and Richard III in Washington in April, which is said to have been his favorite roles. The drama critic of the National Republicans said that Booth took the hearts of the audience by storm and his performances were a complete triumph. As the Battle of Gettysburg raged in Pennsylvania, 
Booth finished off his acting season at Cleveland's Academy of Music in early July of 1863. Booth had a very hectic schedule in the months of September through November of 1863, where he played in mostly northeastern United States, appearing in the cities of Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, and Hartford, Connecticut. Infatuated women sent him love correspondences every day. John T. Ford, who was a family friend of the Booths, opened a 1,500-seat theater called Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on November 9th, where Booth was one of the first leading men to play at the theater. There, he played Charles Shelby's The Marble Heart, where he played a Greek sculptor that made marble statues come to life. Lincoln watched this play from a box office at the top of the theater, and at one point during the performance, Booth is said to have turned toward him and shake his finger at Lincoln while he delivered a dialogue. Lincoln's sister-in-law was sitting in the box with him and said to him, Mr. Lincoln, he looks as if that is meant for you. And Lincoln is said to have responded with, He does look pretty sharp at me, doesn't he? Tad Lincoln, President Lincoln's son, had seen one of Booth's plays, and he is said to have thrilled him so much it prompted him to give him a rose. Booth later ignored invitations to visit with Lincoln between acts. In a single run of Julius Caesar with his brothers Edwin and Junius, Booth played the role of Mark Anthony, and his brother played the role of Brutus at the Winter Garden Theater in New York, where the play received high acclaim and praise, with critics calling it the greatest theatrical event in New York history. In Central Park, there is a statue of William Shakespeare where the proceeds from this show went toward. The statue still stands today. Booth played the role of Romeo in Romeo and Juliet in Washington, D.C., where the newspaper The National Intelligencer said of his character, the most satisfactory of all renderings of that fine character, and gave high praise to his death scene. Booth's final performance was in March of 1865, where he played the role of Duke Pescara in The Apostate at Ford's Theater. Booth needed something to do with all his money he was making. He contacted the manager of Cleveland Academy of Music, John Elsler, and the two of them, along with a man named Thomas Mears, went into the oil business together. Together, they bought 31.5 acres along the Allegheny River in Franklin, Pennsylvania, and developed it for oil drilling. By 1864, they had a drill that was named Wilhelmina after Elsler's wife that was 1,900 feet deep and produced 25 barrels a day of crude oil, which was considered a good yield back then. The men were impatient and wanted higher yields, so they resorted to using explosives to mine, which wrecked the drill and ended production. As the Civil War raged in the South, Booth was becoming more and more obsessed with their dire situation and angered at President Lincoln's re-election, so he withdrew from the oil business where he suffered a major loss of his investments. Booth attended the hanging of abolitionist leader John Brown on December 2, 1859. Brown was hanged for treason, murder, and inciting a slave revolt. These charges came from his raid on the Federal Armory in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. At the time of the hanging, Booth was rehearsing at the Richmond Theater and saw a newspaper where he read about Brown's upcoming execution. He wanted special access that the public would not have, so he borrowed a uniform of the Richmond Greys, which was a unit of volunteer militia that guarded against any attempts to save Brown from the gallows by force. After Brown was executed, Booth stood next to the gallows and is said to have had a look of satisfaction on his face, though he admired Brown's courage for facing his execution stoically. In November of 1860, President Lincoln was re-elected as president. Later that year, Booth drafted a long speech that was never delivered. The speech decried northern abolitionism and made clear his support for the South and for slavery. April 12, 1861 marked the beginning of the Civil War, and 11 states seceded from the Union. Some slaveholding portions of the population of Maryland favored joining the Confederate States of America, but a decisive vote, 53-13, to 13, voted against seceding on April 28th. This vote also did not allow federal troops to use the state's railways to move troops and requested that federal troops be removed from Maryland that were stationed there at the time. It would seem that this legislature wanted to stay with the Union but also did not want to go to war with its southern neighbors. It is no doubt that the intention of this legislature was to demand that the infrastructure of Maryland not be used in this way but also left the federal capital of Washington, D.C. exposed and would disallow the prosecution of war against the South. 
Many of Maryland's political leaders were imprisoned with the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and martial law was imposed on Baltimore and other portions of the state, and Lincoln stationed federal troops in Baltimore. Many Marylanders, to include Booth, supported the ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court that the suspension of the writ and the posting of the federal troops was unconstitutional. Booth continued to perform during the 1860s in the North and the South and as far west as New Orleans. He had once confided in his sister, Asia, that he used his position to smuggle an anti-malaria drug to the South that the residents of the Gulf Coast were in dire need of because of the Northern Blockade. In a divided family, Booth was pro-Confederate. Booth was very outspoken in his love of the South and was equally outspoken in his hatred of Lincoln and the abolitionists. Because of this, Booth continued to quarrel with his brother Edwin who declined to make stage appearances in the South and refused to listen to Booth's fierce denunciations of Lincoln and the North. Booth was arrested in St. Louis in 1863 while in theater tour because he was heard saying that he wished the president and the whole damned government would go to hell. There, he was charged with making treasonous remarks against the government. He was later released after he took an oath to the Union and paid a hefty fine. The Knights of the Golden Circle was a secret organization founded by George W. L. Bickley with the objective of obtaining territories as slave states and create a new country called the Golden Circle where slavery would be legal. Booth is alleged to have been a member of this group, but it was never confirmed. Booth became secretly engaged to Lucy Lambert Hale in February of 1865, the daughter of New Hampshire Senator John P. Hale when Booth received blessings from his mother for their marriage plans. She wrote to him in a letter saying, You have so often been dead in love, be well assured she is really and truly devoted to you. However, Lucy was unaware of Booth's d deep dislike toward Lincoln. The likelihood of President Lincoln winning the 1864 presidential election was looming and the tide of the war was favoring the North. Both of these factors increased the rage that Booth felt toward both Lincoln and the North. Booth blamed President Lincoln for the war and all the South's troubles. Booth had made a promise to his mother that he would not enlist as a soldier to fight in the war, but he grew increasingly angry for not fighting with the South. He wrote a letter to her stating, I have begun to deem myself a coward and to despise my own existence. With this, he began to drop a plan to kidnap President Lincoln from the old soldier's home which was Lincoln's summer home and three miles from the White House, and smuggle him across the Potomac River into Richmond, Virginia, and deliver him into Confederate hands. Once there, Lincoln would be traded for Confederate prisoners of war being held in North prisons, which Booth reasoned would bring the war to an end by emboldening opposition to the war in the North and force Union recognition of the Confederate government. The Confederacy maintained a network of underground operators in Southern Maryland throughout the Civil War, more specifically in Charles and St. Mary's counties. These networks smuggled Confederate recruits into Virginia across the Potomac River and relayed messages for the Confederacy as far north as Canada. Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Loughlin were recruited as accomplices of Booth's, and they often met at the house of Confederate sympathizer named Maggie Branson in Baltimore. Booth also met with other well-known sympathizers at the Parker House in Boston. Booth made an unexplained trip to Montreal in October of 1864. Montreal was the center of clandestine Confederate activity at the time, where he spent ten days, staying at times in St. Lawrence Hall, which was a rendezvous for the Confederate Secret Service, and met with several Confederate agents there. No proof has been linked to Booth's kidnapping or assassination plots to a conspiracy involving the leadership of the Confederate government, but David Herbert Donald, a historian, states that at least at the lower levels of the Southern Secret Service, the abduction of the Union president was under consideration. Thomas Goodrich, another historian, concludes that Booth entered the Confederate Secret Service as a spy and a courier. President Lincoln won the November election by a landslide in 1864, with his platform being abolishing slavery by constitutional amendment. Meanwhile, Booth devoted most of his time, energy, and money in his plot to kidnap the president. Booth recruited a loose-knit band of Confederate sympathizers, David Harold, George Atzerdot, and Lewis Powell, and rebel agent John Surratt. 
these men met regularly at a boarding house of Surratt's mother, Mary Surratt. Booth and his older pro-union brother Edwin were constantly arguing by this time, and Edwin finally told Booth that he was no longer welcome at his home in New York. Booth also railed against Lincoln with his sister Asia, saying of him, That man's appearance, his pedigree, his coarse low jokes and anecdotes, his vulgar similes, and his policy are disgrace to the seat he holds. He has made the tool of the North to crush out slavery. As the Confederate defeat became more certain, Booth's sister Asia recalls that Booth went on more tirades decrying Lincoln's re-election. At Lincoln's inauguration on March 4th, Booth was in attendance as the guest of his secret fiancée Lucy Hale. Amongst the crowd were Powell, Atzerdot, and Harold. Though there was no attempt to assassinate the president at the inauguration, Booth said that he had excellent chance to kill the president if I had wished. Booth later learned that the president would be attending a performance of the play Still Waters Run Deep at a hospital near the old soldier's home. Booth assembled his team of cohorts on the road near the old soldier's home, where he hoped to kidnap the president en route to the hospital, but later learned that the president had changed his plans at the last minute where he attended a reception of the National Hotel in Washington where Booth was staying. Booth heard the news that Robert E. Lee had surrendered at the Apotomax Courthouse on April 12, 1865, sealing the end of the Confederate's war with the Union along with the capture of Richmond. With this, he told Louis J. Weichmann, a friend of John Surratt and boarder at Mary Surratt's house, that he was done with acting and that the only play he wanted to present was Venice Preserved, which Weichmann did not understand the reference at the time. Venice Preserved was a play about an assassination plot. Booth was in a crowd with hundreds of other people at the White House the previous day where Lincoln gave a speech from his window stating that he was in favor of granting suffrage to the former slaves. Suffrage to the former slaves is regarding the 15th Amendment to the Constitution where it prohibits the federal government and each state from denying or abridging a citizen's right to vote on account of race, color, or previous conditions of servitude and was ratified on February 3, 1870. This infuriated Booth, and he declared that it would be the last speech that Lincoln ever gave. On the morning of Good Friday in April of 1865, Booth went to Ford's Theater to get his mail. While he was there, Ford's brother told Booth that the President and Mrs. Lincoln would be attending a showing of Our American Cousin at the theater that evening, where he would be accompanied by General and Mrs. Ulysses S. Grant. This put Booth in a race to make plans for an assassination. The plans included making arrangements with the livery stable owner, James Humphrey, for a getaway horse and an escape route. That night, Booth informed Powell, Harold, and Atzerdot of his intention to assassinate Lincoln. Booth assigned Powell to assassinate Secretary of State William Seward and Atzerdot to assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson, and he assigned Harold to assist in their escape into Virginia. Michael Kaufman, a Lincoln historian, wrote that he believed that Booth thought that targeting Lincoln and his two immediate successors to the presidency, Booth intended to decapitate the Union government and send it into a state of chaos and panic. However, in 1865, the second presidential successor would have been Lafayette S. Foster, the president pro tempore of the U.S. Senate and not Secretary Seward. Grant and his wife had declined the invitation to the theater at the insistence of Mrs. Grant, thus foiling the attempt to assassinate the leader of the Union Army's commanding general, where they instead left by train that evening for New Jersey to visit relatives there. Booth had hoped that by committing these assassinations that it would allow the Confederate government to recognize and continue the war if one of the Confederate Army remained in the field, or, if that failed, he would avenge the South's defeat. Because Booth was a famous actor and had performed at Ford's Theater on several occasions, he had free access to the theater. Booth was well known by the owner, John T. Ford, and even had his mail sent there. Many believed that Booth had bored a spy hole into the door of the presidential box earlier that day so that he could observe the occupants of the box to verify that the president had indeed arrived at the play. However, a letter from Frank Ford, son of the theater manager Harry Clay Ford, to George Oslaski, who was a National Park Service historian, states, Booth did not bore the hole in the door leading to the box. The hole was bored by my father to allow the guard to look into the box. Booth slipped into the theater 
one last time around 10.15 that evening as the play progressed and shot President Lincoln in the back of the head with a 41 caliber Derringer pistol. Major Henry Rathbone and fiance Clara Harris were in the box with the President and Mrs. Lincoln. The startled Major Rathbone lunged at Booth, almost thwarted Booth's escape, but was stabbed in the process. Mrs. Harris was not harmed. From there, Booth jumped from the presidential box to the stage, where he reportedly snagged his spurs on a flag and either broke or injured his leg and yelled, Sic Semper Tyrannis, with a raised knife. The quote in Latin means, Thus always to tyrants. And it is from Brutus at Caesar's assassination and later became the state motto of Maryland. According to some eyewitnesses, Booth is said to have also yelled, I have done it. The South is avenged. Speculation states that Booth did not injure his leg in the leap from the box as he was able to make a hurried escape to the stage door where a horse was being held for him by a man named Joseph Burroughs. Historian Michael Kaufman contends that Booth's injured leg was the result of a later incident in his flight to escape when his horse tripped and fell on him. Booth was the only assassin able to complete his mission that night. Powell was stabbed by Seward, who was bedridden as a result of an earlier carriage accident and was seriously injured but survived. Atzerdot lost his nerve and instead spent the night drinking at a saloon instead of making an attempt on Vice President Johnson. Southern Maryland was very sparsely populated, so Booth, along with David Harold, used the area as their escape route. The area was predominantly filled with Confederate sympathizers and lacked telegraphs and railroads, making it ideal for their escape. The area was densely forested and had the Zakaya Swamp, which made it easy for them to escape into rural Virginia. Nine miles away, in Brandywine Pike, Booth and Harold arrived at the Surratt's Tavern. Here, they had stored guns and other equipment from earlier in the year when they planned to kidnap Lincoln. Booth and Harold stopped just before dawn to tend to Booth's injured leg in St. Catherine at the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd, 25 miles from Washington. When Mudd asked how he injured his leg, Booth stated it was an injured when his horse fell. The next day, the men arrived at the home of Samuel Cox at around 4 a.m. The men hid in the woods outside of Cox's home while Cox contacted his brother, Thomas Jones, who was a Confederate agent and in charge of spy operations in Southern Maryland since 1862. The War Department issued a $100,000 reward on any information leading to the arrest of Booth and his accomplices. Federal troops were also dispatched to extensively search Southern Maryland after a tip they had received. While Booth hid in the woods of Maryland, he read the accounts of a national morning from newspapers that Jones brought him every day. By mid-April, he had learned that some of his co-conspirators, Mary Surratt, Powell, Arnold, and O'Loughlin, had been arrested. Booth was surprised that there was not as much public sympathy as he thought there would be, especially from some of the anti-Lincoln newspapers. On April 21st, Booth wrote of his dismay in his journal as he waited for night to come so he could better cross the Potomac River and into Virginia. This is what he wrote. For six months we had worked to capture, but our cause being almost lost, something decisive and great must be done. I struck boldly, and not as the papers say. I can never repent it, though we hated to kill. That night, Jones provided Booth and Harold a boat and a compass to cross the Potomac River. They were navigating at night and lost their bearing and somehow ended up ashore again in Maryland. Harold knew the area well as he'd hunted it before and recognized a farm that belonged to a Confederate sympathizer. The farmer's son-in-law was also a Confederate sympathizer and led them to Colonel John Hughes, where he provided the men refuge and food until night fell and they could attempt to cross the river again. Booth and Harold finally landed in Virginia on April 23rd, where they made contact with Thomas Harbin, whom Booth had known from his plot to kidnap Lincoln. Harbin brought them to another Confederate agent, William Bryant, who supplied them with horses. Booth and Harold were tracked to the farm of Richard Garrett, about two miles south of Port Royal, Virginia. They were pursued by a detachment of 26 Union soldiers led by Colonel Everton Conger. Booth and Harold were led to the farm by William Jett, who was a former private in the 9th Virginia Cavalry. Booth was introduced to the Garrett as James W. Boyd, who was returning home after being wounded in the Battle of Petersburg. The Garretts were unaware of the assassination of the president at the time. Richard Garrett, who was the Garretts' 11-year-old son, was an eyewitness to the events, 
said Booth and Harold arrived at their farm, which was on the road to Bowling Green, a town located in Caroline County, at around 3 p.m. on Monday afternoon. With the collapse of the Confederacy, the mail system had been disrupted, so the family had no idea that the president had been assassinated. Cogner tracked down Jet and after interrogating, learned that Booth was hiding at the Garrett farm. Just as Don approached on April 26th, Cogner and his men caught up with the fugitives who were hiding in the tobacco barn on the Garrett farm. Booth and Harold were told to come out and surrender. Harold surrendered, but Booth refused and said he'd rather come out and fight. Cogner ordered his men to set the barn on fire. As Booth avoided the flames inside the barn, he was shot by Sergeant Boston Corbett. Corbett later reported that Booth had raised a pistol to fire at them, so he shot him. Cogner wanted Corbett punished for disobeying the order of taking Booth alive. The bullet pierced Booth's vertebrae and partially severed his spinal cord, paralyzing him. His last words were said to have been, Tell my mother I died for my country, and died as Don was breaking from asphyxiation from his wounds. This concludes our episode about John Wilkes Booth. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed. Now for some strange laws that are still on the books. In Pennsylvania, you actually have to dismantle your car and hide if you're sharing the road with a team of skittish horses. In Missouri, you cannot, under any circumstances, drive with an uncaged bear in your car. Florida's elephant riders get no special treatment. If planning on parking their elephant at a paid meter, they must pop in some change. North Dakota forbids serving beer and pretzels at the same time. Oklahoma warns that you can expect to pay a fine if you make ugly faces at someone's dog. Thank you for joining us on this journey through time. We hope you enjoyed the trip. We hope you'll join us again for more historical tales that happen across the globe. New shows on Mondays and Fridays. Make sure to check us out on Facebook and follow us on our socials.